I thank the choir. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Joanne, for helping bring us into an even greater time of worship today, to be receptive to hear God's words to us. I want to take a moment and just give you some background information on evangelist Nate Garrett. Nate uh, graduated from Liberty University, where he met the love of his wife, who is with us here today. He and Debbie have been married for over 16 years. They live right here in Statesville, and they have two children, Luke and Leia, and all the Star Wars fans cheer. Thank you. Hey. A little over eight years ago, God began to open the doors for Nate uh, to be able to speak to teens and adults outside of his local church. Since then, God has turned those opportunities into a full-time ministry. He has had the opportunity to teach and equip students and adults through uh, camps and school assemblies, discipleship now, weekends, uh, revivals, conferences, retreats, chapels, concerts, and many other places in 16 different states and two countries. He's currently the campus pastor at Liberty Preparatory Christian Academy in Mooresville, where he teaches apologetics and a biblical worldview. His desire is to pour into students and adults in a way that challenges them to go forwards as well as to reinforce the timeless, timeless truths of Scripture. And I'm excited to have him here today. I would like to encourage you to enthusiastically welcome him as he uh, delivers our message today. Come on up, Nate. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Uh, one, one thing as, a, as an evangelist, oftentimes I find out I'm going to go speak somewhere. It could be a camp, it could be a retreat, conference, and then they tell me the theme. They're like, and here's what we want you to preach about. So I really appreciate not being told exactly what to preach about. It's a treat for an evangelist to actually say, you know what? I can just do exactly what God's laying on my heart currently. I can preach something that I've never preached on, that I've never heard preached on, something like that. Maybe you, some of you have been around longer than me. My parents are here this morning speaking about um, being here longer than me uh, from Florida. They're visiting us. It's actually my wife's birthday today, so uh, I can't tell you that she's 39. I mean, she's 39 today, uh, but I'm... I'm, I'm glad to have them with me and my kids as well. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I hope you have your Bibles this morning. We're going to be using it all week in case you're wondering. But we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 6. We're going to start in 2 Kings chapter 6. Now, um, the first part of 2 Kings chapter 6, I've heard messages on my entire life. I've preached on it before, and it's where Elisha uh, is, is being... The Arameans are coming to kill him, basically, and he blinds them and just speaks it over them. And they, they go blind, and then he leads them right into Samaria, and they're captured by the king. And, but instead of killing them, they feed them. And then the Arameans, that raiding party, stops raiding for a while. Uh, so that's, that's the one I've always heard, but I'd never heard a message preached before on 2 Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 24. And I started, as I was reading this again recently and going back through the Old Testament, I thought, wow, this is really, really rich. This has got a lot of stuff. I don't know if this stuff is suitable for Sunday morning typically, but that's why I have to try it at a different church because the worst that could happen is you never, ever ask me back. No, I'm just kidding. So anyway, it's, it's scripture, and I know you're good with scripture, but there's some things that happen here that don't happen a whole lot in scripture, um, but I promise, stay with me, we are going somewhere with this. We are going to make a point with this. So we're going to start at verse 24. Now, what, is, what has happened at this point, just a little bit of background, is, is a famine has besieged the land at, at, at Elisha's consent that this is happening, and people are getting really, really poor. The Arameans come along. They decide it's not just the raiding party this time. It's their entire army, and they besiege the city, and people are starving to death. And I don't know if you've ever been hungry before, but when you're hungry, and usually it'll happen towards the end of my sermon, some of you will know what I'm talking about. And you'll start to think about that restaurant you're going to or that thing that's in the crock pot at home. <laughs> and it'll start, I know what he's talking about now. I've been hungry every Sunday morning right around 12, 12, 15, 12, 30. I don't know. I think you guys get out of 130 here is what I was, <laughs> what I was told. So um, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But these people are really hungry. And we start in verse 24. Sometime later, Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, mobilized his entire army and marched up and laid siege to Samaria. There was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver. Let's just stop there just for a second. A donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver. Um, 80 shekels of silver 
roughly, it was about $339 worth of silver right now. That's a lot of money for a donkey's head. That's not, I mean, that's currently this, I checked the silver prices this week, and that's about what it'd be, about $339 for this donkey's head. How, how hard up do you have to be to want to eat a donkey's head in the first place, but then to pay $339 for it? I've passed over stuff that most people would just pick up just because it wasn't on sale at the grocery store before. I'm kind of an Aldi shopper. I like getting the cheapest thing possible. But this, this donkey said, when you're that hungry, you'll buy anything. And then it says, and a quarter of a cab of seed pods. Now, that's a very nice way of saying dove's dung. All right, if you look at, if you've got a uh, study Bible, you'll look down and you'll find out, wait a minute, seed pods. This isn't something that you're going to plant in your yard. This is, this is bird poo, and it's not, it's not the best thing to talk about, but that's what it is. And I'm convinced that birds can aim, by the way. I, was, I learned in science that they can't and that they, just, they have no control over that. And it just comes out when it comes out. But I'm convinced that birds can aim. They aim at cars. They aim at people without hair. They aim at certain things. We were at Walmart yesterday with just my kids. We were, they were looking for a birthday present for their mom. And we, we heard just birds shrieking. Just, I don't know if they were shrieking, but so many of them, it sounded terrible. And I thought maybe they were on the roof of Walmart, but they were in all those trees out front. And as we walked through two of them, I said, hey, watch this. And all the birds, I hope I didn't wake anybody up. Uh, all the birds just stopped all of a sudden, but then droppings hit all around me, and the bear almost got me. So I, I, I'm convinced that they can aim. Either that or I really scared those birds pretty good. But when a donkey's head looks appetizing, that's one thing. When, when bird poo, when, when this dove's dung starts selling, because people know that based on what the birds eat, there might be some nutritional content left in there, that is desperation. They've come to the point of desperation. They're selling it for five shekels. And five shekels is about $28 in today's silver. All right, that's, that's, that's not, I don't mean 28 silver dollars, that's a lot of money, but the $28 worth of silver that they were buying this dove's dung for. And as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, help me, my lord, the king. And the king replied, if the Lord does not help you, where can I get help for you? And by the way, this king is not following God. So this isn't just a, wait a minute. This isn't theological here. This is descriptive, not prescriptive. He's speaking out of desperation as well. And he says, if the Lord does not help you, where can I get help for you? From the threshing floor, I mean, there's nothing out there. From the wine press, we're out of grapes. Then he asks her, what's the matter? And so she tells him. She answers, this woman said to me, and this is the, the point of desperation. We went from donkey's head to dove's dung. It's going to get worse. She said, this woman said to me, give up your son so that we may eat him today. And tomorrow we'll eat my son. Now, if you've never done a reading through scripture before all the way through and you've just kind of stayed in your favorite Psalms and Proverbs and the New Testament and a few things in Genesis and you get lost around Leviticus and start over in the, in the Gospels, I know people like that. You're like, wait a minute, there's cannibalism in scripture? Yes, here it is. We found it right on a Sunday morning. And she says, so that we may cook him and eat him and then we'll have my son tomorrow. So verse 29, so we cooked my son and ate him. And the next day I said to her, give up your son so we may eat him. But she had hidden him. I don't think this lady was ever planning on bringing her son to the table, literally. It was, she was tricking this other lady to do this with her son out of desperation. People who had been eating dove's dung, people who, had, who didn't have the money to afford the donkey's head that was selling at the market are now resorting to eating their kids. And I can't even... I can't even place myself. Sometimes in the Bible you can be like, huh, now if, if I was there, we had the WWJD bracelets for several years, you remember those? You tried to put yourself in the, in the mind of the king of kings. Well, what would Jesus do here? Usually it's hard to think of what Jesus would do because we're so bent on what we typically do. But I really try to put my, 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 my perspective into this lady's mind here and I can't do it. 
I don't know if they thought, if they had rationalized in their mind that this was some sort of act of mercy because they didn't have any food left for their kids anyway, and that maybe this is better than seeing them starve slowly. Whatever it is, it has resorted to desperation, and the desperation has resorted to all kinds of evil. And now and it's so bad that she thinks it's appropriate to tell the king that she had murdered someone. The guy who's supposed to dispense justice to the land. Just, hey, king, hey, the, we ate my son, and we're supposed to eat her son. Tell her to bring her son out. I mean, like, what does she think is going to happen there? If this famine wasn't going on, she would lose her life over this act. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes. As he went along the wall, the people looked, and they saw that under his robes he had sackcloth on his body. Now, this is a leader who's trying to put on a brave face for the entire nation. He had been wearing sackcloth against his skin, but he wasn't willing to publicly say he was in mourning because he had to look tough for everybody else. And it wasn't until he tore his robes that they saw that he's been in mourning this entire time. And that leads the people from desperation to hopelessness because now well, well, at, least, at least the king looks like he thinks we're going to pull out of this and then they see that the king doesn't even believe what he's selling to them and everybody begins to lose hope. He tears his robes and the people see what's underneath the robes and he said, may God deal with me be it ever so severely if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, remains on his shoulders today. Instead of realizing that maybe he had led his kingdom astray, he places the blame on the prophet of God. He says, oh, he's going to die. And he is going to die today. Verse 32, now Elisha was sitting in his house and the elders were sitting with him. The king sent a messenger ahead, but before he arrived, Elisha said to the elders, see the Holy Spirit of God tipped him off here, and Elisha said, don't you see how this murderer is sending someone to cut off my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold it shut against him. Is not the sound of his master's footsteps behind him. In other words, I'm not going to let this messenger just kind of sneak in and take my life under the guise that I have a message from the king. The king's coming to check to make sure the deed is done. Hold the door until the king gets here as well. While he was still talking to them, the messenger came down to them. And the king said, this disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? The king who was falling behind. And verse, verse 1 of chapter 7, Elisha replies, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a sea of the finest flour will sell for a shekel. That's about 12 pounds of flour that he's talking about. It would fit in about, if you took two liter bottles after you're finished with the soda, it'd be about 14.7 liters. So you'd need seven of those two liters and then another one to just catch a little bit. That's a lot of flour. He says, and two seas of barley for a shekel. That's 20 pounds. Now, if you're thinking, wait a minute, 20 pounds and 12, should it be 10 pounds and 20 pounds? Well, barley and flour weigh different amounts. But this is basically 20 pounds of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to the man of God, look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of heaven, of the heavens, could this happen? You will see it with your own eyes, answered Elisha, but you will not eat any of it. He calls this man out for his doubt, but it does sound far-fetched. If it's, if it's, 80 shekels for a donkey's head, and you're trying to tell me I'm going to get 12 pounds of flour tomorrow for one shekel? When there's nothing, there's no food, there's nothing in the wine press, there's nothing on the threshing floor, there is nowhere to draw this food from to even sell it for that. There isn't food. It's not available. And so this guy said something that sounds, um, from earthly knowledge, it sounds not it doesn't sound like doubt. It sounds like common sense. Even if God himself would open the windows of heaven, <laughs> could this happen? And Elisha says, yeah, it's going to happen. But you won't get to be blessed by it because of his doubt. Now, in verse 3, it kind of seems like the story shifts. But this is God working 
to make this prophecy that Elisha just said happen. And we move to an even more desperate situation. Now you think if you get desperate enough to eat your kids, that's pretty desperate, by the way. That's pretty desperate. And uh, I realize we've got kids in here too, and I think one of the, one of the, one of the interesting things about the Bible, especially the Old Testament, is sometimes kids get excited about the Old Testament for the weirdest reasons. My, my son was in preschool at our church in the preschool Sunday school room, and it's probably, probably three years old, I think, and they were talking about David and Goliath, and, and they were given the preschool version of it, where they had taken out most of the violence, you know, <laughs> and, the, and, and, and David took that rock, and he, he slung it up, and he hit Goliath in the forehead, and the Israelites won. You know, that's how they ended it. And my son said, no. No, he cut off his head and carried it back to the king by his hair. You know, like, and so she was mortified. This, this preschool teacher was not prepared for this. But I think some of these details sometimes, they, they, they start this lifelong pursuit of like, whoa, cool. Because sometimes kids think it's all, you know, the only cool battles and stuff take place in fiction. But they actually take place in reality as well. And these are real things that actually happen. And so you've got people who are, who are buying the donkey's heads and resorting to eating that. It doesn't sound appetizing. Uh, I might would try it if I was in another country. Uh, the dove's dung, that's not going to happen no matter where I go. I'm never going to eat my own kids. But what would be worse about starving to death would be starving to death with a debilitating disease at the same time. Well, you've got all of these. You don't just have the symptoms of starvation, but you've got the stuff you've been living with. And we come upon these four lepers in chapter 7. And I googled some pictures of leprosy to show you this morning. And then I saw them and changed my mind. I was like, Ugh, I don't even want to see that again. Leprosy is not cool. And it dulls the nerves. It's a skin disorder. And people end up losing fingers and toes and ears and nose. And anything hanging off, it's falling off. And, and so these are the pictures I saw on Google and decided against it. I thought, you know what, I don't think anybody wants to see that before they go to Golden Corral or wherever you happen to be headed today. You won't be able to eat. And it says in verse 3, Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. And they said to each other, Why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go, and they start looking at their options. Here's option one. If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there. <laughs> it's no different. It's not like we're just dying of leprosy out here. There's no food in there if we went into the city. They got option two. If we stay here, we will die. Both options have the same outcome. I don't know if you noticed that. We can go in the city. There's no food. We'll die. We can stay where we're sitting and we'll die. So they throw in a third option. So let's go over to the camp of the Aramaeans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. All three options have the possibility of death. Two are certain. One has a glimmer of hope. It's not likely that the Aramaeans are going to welcome in lepers into their camp. This isn't a day and age where people had to, if you got near the lepers, they would have to call out unclean so that you would know to get away from them because it was highly contagious. And so this isn't something that's probably going to, what do we got in the distance there? It looks like some people with, they're missing some fingers. Yeah. Yeah, looks like they've got leprosy. All right, get the archers. Let's take them out on the way here. So the, the possibility of death, of going and surrendering and, and, and then dying is very high. There's just a small sliver of hope. They're hoping that people who are besieging their city, trying to kill everybody, who have tried to kill everybody in the past, are going to give them some food. And to allow them to live any longer. That's a very, very slim hope that they're holding on to. This entire time they've been besieging the city. Basically, when you besiege a city, if anybody comes out, you kill them, right? They're allowing the lepers to sit outside the city because they're not a threat. And the people inside, they don't want them either. They have to stay outside the city gates, outside the city walls. So they say, if we go in there... We're going to die. If we stay here, we're going to die. If we go there, we'll probably die. But just maybe. Just maybe we'll have a chance. At dusk, they got up. And they went to the camp of Aramaeans. What a great choice. Let's go when it's a little bit dark. 
where you can't really tell who we are in advance. Maybe we'll get a morsel to eat before they take us out. You know, it's a good time of day to go if you're a leper. Also because they didn't like, they like to cover up and they didn't like to walk in the hot sun and so forth because of their skin disorder. So at dusk they got up and they went to the camp of the Arameans. When they reached the edge of the camp, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear a sound of chariots and horses and a great army so that they, look, they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and the Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and their donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. These are military men who are experienced in military. They're currently laying siege to a city. They know how to do this. And the sound that God caused them to hear... It didn't make sense to them that it was the Israelites coming out to fight them. That eh, wouldn't have sounded like that. There weren't enough. It didn't make sense that the Hittite kings could have been coming down on them. Or even the Egyptian kings. It had to be at least both of the biggest armies that they could think of. And they had thought maybe somebody had snuck out. Snuck out of Samaria over the wall and went with the seal of the king and hired them with the money they had left. I mean, what are they going to do with the money once they run out of donkey's heads and, and dove's tongue anyway, and given them all this money and hired them to come and free them? That's what they assumed happened, and they ran for their lives because they didn't have the numbers to stop that size of an army, and they keep running. So I, I imagine God just used that sound, that miraculous sound of chariots racing to just follow them as they went. I mean, if you rounded the bend and you didn't hear it anymore, you'd go back. But they keep running and running to get away from this. Notice they got up and fled in the dusk. God didn't do this until those lepers actually started to move. They got up at dusk and started heading that way. As soon as they got up at dusk and started heading that way, God caused those people to hear that sound and to run off. And he prepared something for those lepers who with a sliver of faith, just a small little mustard seed sized faith that they might be able to make it if they get over to the Arameans and surrender. God began to prepare the camp just for them. He began to lay the table out just for them. Verse eight, the men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp they entered one of the tents and they ate and drank. Everything was exactly as it was. All the food was still set out. The meal was ready. And all those people had fled. And they ate and they drank. And they took silver and gold and clothes and went off and hid them. I don't know how much you can carry without fingers, but they got as much as they could in their arms. And they started carrying these off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. When they said to each other, what then they said to each other, what we're doing is not right. This is a day of good news. And we're keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. This is their guilt talking. Like, I, I can't believe we're even doing this. We're full. We've got all this stuff. There's tents before us. It's going to take us forever. They'd only gone through two tents. This is going to take us forever. And, it w and what benefit to us? This is a day of good news. If we keep it to ourselves and we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report it, this to the royal palace. Let's go tell those people who won't even let us in the town. Let's go tell those people who cause us to sit outside the city gates and yell unclean when they come by. Let's go tell them. Let's let them in on, an, on this awesome victory that is taking place here. So they went and called out to the city gatekeepers and told them, we went to the Aramean camp and no one was there. Not a sound of anyone. Only tethered horses and donkeys and tents left just as they were. Imagine what a whole donkey's worth at this point. It's got everything. It says the gatekeepers shouted the news and it was reported within the palace. There's so much desperation 
that they didn't even just write this off as, oh, that couldn't be. You guys are crazy. The leprosy's gotten to your head. You're sitting in the sun all day with your robes over you and everything. The heat, you've got some kind of heat exhaustion. That's impossible. They didn't do that. They wanted to believe when they heard the good news. So they yelled it to the palace, and it got reported there. And the king got up in the night and said to his officers, I will tell you what the Arameans have done to us. They know we're starving. So they've left the camp to hide in the countryside, thinking they'll surely come out, and then we'll take them alive and get into the city. And one of his officers answered, have some, fi- have some men take five of the horses that are left in the city. Like, notice that five of the horses that are left in the city, there's not many horses left. The king was riding one on the wall that day, but most of the horses, they've probably been eaten by this point, if they're now eating donkey's heads as well. Take five of the horses that are left. Their plight will be like that of the Israelites left here. Yes, they will only be like all the other Israelites who are doomed. So let's send them to find out what happened. I mean, what, what could it hurt, king? If we take five people, the, this guy in the front row and this family, this lovely family right here, and we send them out with horses and they get killed, they were going to die anyway. You know, I mean, what, what, let's at least try. Let's send somebody out to find out what has happened. So verse 14, so they selected two chariots with their horses, and the king sent them after the Aramean army. He commanded the drivers, go find out what has happened. And they followed them as far as the Jordan, and they found the whole road strewn with clothing and equipment the Arameans had thrown away on their headlong flight. <laughs> what good is this armor against such a vast array of chariots and horses that they were hearing from God. What good is it? It's not going to protect me if I, can't, if I can't outrun the army. And so they're just throwing off their armor. They're throwing off anything that's holding them back so that they can keep running and running and running. And as they're trying to find the Aramean army, all they're finding is pieces, evidence that they had run through here. If they were waiting to attack us, surely they would have their armor on and they'd be hidden somewhere so the messengers returned and reported to the king in verse 16 then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Arameans and so a sea of the finest flour was sold for a shekel two seas of barley sold for a shekel as the Lord had said now the king had put the officer on whose arm he leaned in charge of the gate and the people trampled him in the gateway and he died just as the man of God, I mean, they were so excited. He's just kind of standing there at the gate and people are running back and forth with gold and with flour and with, with barley and with everything that they haven't been able to partake of that he, he just falls over as they're pushing through and he ends up being trampled. It happened as the man of God had said to the king about this time tomorrow, a sea of the finest flour will sell for a shekel and a two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Verse 19, the officer had said to the man of God, look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? And the man of God had replied, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat any of it. And that's exactly what happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died. Before we know Jesus Christ, before we have an encounter with the King of Kings, a true encounter with the King of Kings, we are as hopeless as anybody in this story. We have a disease that eats at us called sin. It's, it's constantly out to destroy us. Our enemy is out to destroy us, to steal, to kill, to destroy. And the image of God in us that we were created with is marred. It's messed up to where, where if I look at somebody who doesn't know Jesus Christ, you can still tell that they're in the image of God, but there's something not quite right because it's not a good picture of who God is. That's what I think motivated those WWJD bracelets is we wanted, to, we wanted people to be able to see Jesus in us better. And even before then, when I was a kid, I remember people saying, uh, you may be the only Bible some people read. There's different phrases we've come up with over the years to try to motivate us to live our faith in front of other people. But that image of God, because of sin, has been marred in humanity. It's been messed up. Just like four lepers sitting outside of the gates of the city who can't get in. 
And if they stay there, they're going to die. If we just go into the world and try to get hope in the world, they could go into the city, but there's no hope in the world either. There's nothing that we can do physically or spiritually on our own to try to, to, try to add a day to our life. Can you imagine that? I'm going to add a day to my life. You know, my wife just turned 39. I don't know if she wanted you to know that or not. I told you that earlier. But if she's like, no, I'm not going to do that. On my birthday, I'm just going to sit there and strain and stay 38. You know, probably it might take some time off her life if she's doing that or get an aneurysm or something. But there's nothing you can do to prolong your life physically longer than when you're actually going to die. And we don't know what that date is. And we're not going to live forever. We can't say, you know what? If God's in heaven, I want to go up to where he is. Ready? I'm going to jump. Now, if you do it at the right moment, the rapture happens to be occurring, it might work. But the rest of the time, it's not going to work. We're not going to be able to get into heaven by willing it. We can't add days to our life by simply willing it. The world doesn't have the answer. The answer is not staying how we are. But there's hope through Jesus Christ. He's already laid out a table. He's already but begun construction on his house where he wants you to be a permanent resident. That's things he's already done. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing in Scripture about what you have to do to be made right with God other than what Jesus did on the cross. There's nothing I could do to outweigh my sin. It's not about some sort of cosmic scale where if I do enough good and it outweighs the sin, then, then I'm going to be okay. Any sin messes up the whole thing as if I would take a bottle of water and add a little arsenic to it. There's a couple tablespoons of arsenic in here, but it's 90% spring water. You're not going to drink it. You're not going to want it. It's going to hurt you. It might even kill you. At, at the very least, it's going to hospitalize you. It's not good. And just a little bit of sin, not the evil murderers you can think of and the Adolf Hitlers of history, us. The little things we've done are enough to taint the whole thing. To mess it all up. And so God, in his love for you, he said, death is the penalty for sin. And that death, the penalty, that's from him. He's the one who came up with that. It's not the cosmic universe or anything that says people have to suffer for their sins. God says, sin is so abhorrent to me. It's so, it's so apart from me. It's so below me because I'm holy. I'm other. I'm set apart. The death must be the price for it. But he's not just justice, thank God. He's also love. So in his love, he said, if that's the price, I'll pay it. And so Jesus came to earth. He lived a perfect, holy life, was tempted in every way we are, but he never gave into it. He never gave into it because of you, because he loved you too much and because he hates sin. You know, that's another reason. But he loved you too much to mess up, to be disqualified from being your savior on the cross. And so he went to that cross and he took your sin. And we can sit like those lepers outside the city gate and think, well, yeah, I've heard the gospel. I've heard the good news that Jesus died, was buried. Three days later, he rose from the dead. I'm just not sure if that's for me. I'm just not sure if it's real. I'm just not sure if it's true. Or maybe like Mark Twain, You've met some Christians, and that's what's keeping you back. He said, I would have almost been persuaded to become a Christian had I not met some. But whatever it is that's holding you back from that, and you're sitting right by the city gate, the victory has already been won. You just crest that hill. You'd see that it's all been paid for. That the enemy, his fate is decided. He's been driven out. And you can go and you can enjoy the spoils of the battle that has been won by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You can come to the table like we're going to do here in a few minutes. And you can eat of the table that represents the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's been laid out for you. Not just here, but with him for eternity. So maybe you've come in today and you've never made that decision. 
You're sitting in your sin just like I was. Just sitting there thinking, you know what, well, I'm going to try harder. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try some other things. You see, Jesus has already done it all. He has paid it all, and all to him we owe. Sin left a crimson stain, but he's washed it white as snow. That's what he wants to do in us. So maybe you're there. But just maybe you're a believer this morning, and you're in another situation. You've got up. You've walked over and seen the camp. You've seen the victory has already been won. And you're enjoying the spoils of war. You love going to church on Sunday, getting ready and getting here, learning some things and being in Sunday school and doing the things of God with the people of God and listening to the right music and watching the right things and filtering out the things that shouldn't be. But for some reason, it hasn't dawned on us that, wait a minute, what we're doing is wrong. This is a day of good news. I have to go back to where I used to be and tell the people that don't know about it yet. I can't just say, you know, and I'm not saying that those things are wrong. Going to church is a great thing. You meet the people of God, you sharpen each other, you spur each other on to good works so that people can see the love of God in you. But if we just start to enjoy the things of God, we can forget about the commission from God. I believe that what, that's what this revival is about this week. The people of God, thinking about their neighbors, their relatives, their friends, their co-workers, their classmates, and saying, you know what, I think this message is too good for me to keep to myself. I'm going to invite them, not just to come hear some guy talk about this, but so that we can talk about, hey, what do you think about what you heard tonight? Let's go out for coffee or ice cream or whatever it is you like to do. Let's have a conversation. You know, 80 to 95% of Christians according to George Barna, will go to their grave without ever leading somebody to Jesus Christ. This may be the very week you step out of that large percentage and we start growing that small percentage of people who want to be soul winners, who want to share their faith with other people, who say, you know what, this is great, and what I have with God is great, but it's too good to keep to myself. So as we do a hymn of invitation in just a moment, as the pianists come, you might be in one of several situations. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. I would encourage you as we sing, as we stand and sing in a moment, to come and make sure that you know the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. To grab Pastor Matthew by the hand and say, hey, I need... I need to make sure that I know Jesus Christ. I'm not just going through the church motions. The, batter, the battle has been won for me. The victory has already fought. Christians don't fight for victory. We fight from a position of victory. I want to join that victory that's already been won. I want to get rid of that sin that's holding me back from having a relationship with God. I want to know Jesus. However you phrase it, he'll know what you're talking about. I need God. Maybe you're a Christian today who's enjoying the spoils of what God has blessed us with, but there are other people who, who haven't. They don't, they don't have a relationship with Jesus. And maybe God's laying somebody on your mind and you just like, we'd like to open the altars up. Maybe you want to just come and pray for somebody, somebody that's in your life that doesn't know Jesus Christ. Pray to be used. Pray for the boldness, the very words, the anointing, the opportunity that you would have a conversation with them that might, might seep into their heart. Pray for their heart to be softened. Pray for the circumstances. That I prayed for a guy one time sitting in a counseling room. I, I prayed out loud for him. I said, God, pray, I just ask that you would make Wesley 100% miserable until he comes to you. When I got done praying, he said, what did you do that for? <laughs> You'll see. Wesley's a believer now. It's been several years. He was an alcoholic at the time and so forth, and he told me um, just a few months back that was one of the best prayers anybody's ever prayed for me. Why did you do that? I said, I, that's what came to me at the time. I didn't feel like we were getting through to you, and I thought maybe life could get through to you because life's terrible sometimes. 
But now he has hope in Jesus Christ. Maybe you want to pray for someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been coming here for a while, but you've not made that, uh, that step to be a member of Oakdale. You say, I like what's going on here. I like the mission. I like where they're going with this. And you can make that step this morning and grab Pastor Matthew and say, I, I need to join in with what you're doing here. I want to be a member. And I don't know what the process is for that, but it starts with telling them you want to be. Maybe you have given your life to Jesus Christ, but you've never followed him in believer's baptism. And you say, I, I don't care how old you are. Maybe you've been a Christian for 30 years and you haven't done it. Maybe you became a Christian last week and you haven't done it. Either way, Jesus says, this is what I want you to do. Go into the world, preach the gospel. And the second thing, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Right off, it's part of the Great Commission. It's not for salvation, but it's a picture of it. So maybe you need to do that and say, you know, I haven't been baptized. And whenever the next baptism is here, I want to get on the schedule for that. I want to make sure that I follow Jesus and be obedient to that. Whatever God's calling you to do, I pray that you would be obedient this morning. I want to pray for you. And we're going to stand and we're going to sing this hymn of invitation. You respond as the Lord leads you. Maybe you have some other prayer need that you'd like to pray for that I didn't mention specifically. You can still use these altars here to talk to God about that. Absolutely, you could stay in your seat and do the same thing. But if God is saying, hey, I want you to move. Hey, I want you to, to, to get out of your seat and I want you to do this. Well, be obedient to what the Holy Spirit is asking you to do. Father, I thank you so much for these, your people. And God, for those in this room that are yet to be your people, but that you have died for. God, I pray that you would use this week to remind us who we are. That we are blood-bought children of the Lamb if we know you. And that, that we are the objects of your affection and love and pursuit if we don't. So God, I pray that you would have your way in our hearts, in our homes, and in our life. And God, we'll give you all the glory and honor and praise for anything that you do this week. Because it's all from you. God, this is a day of good news. Your gospel has already provided for us the victory. In Jesus' name, amen.